Well, hello there. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And this episode, we're covering the dates of September 6th through September 12th. And we're going to start things off by talking about the great positioning of the planets and where the moon will pass by early in the week. Then we're going to focus in on a relatively overlooked constellation of Capricornus the Sea Goat. It's rising in the east where Jupiter and Saturn lie right now. And then we're going to end things by mentioning the opposition of the asteroid known as Pallas that's happening by the end of the week. So let's get to it. If you've been spending any time outside lately just after sunset in the evening, you may have noticed some really bright planets on either side of the sky. And if you look off to the west and southwest just after sunset, you've probably already seen the brightest planet that you can see from Earth, and that of course is Venus. We've talked a lot about this lately. Venus really, really shines with that very thick atmosphere that reflects a lot of light from the sun back to us. And so it's been really nice. Venus has been high enough above the horizon so you have a good amount of time to see it in the evening before it sets. And if you notice carefully, just below it is a relatively bright star. This one right here known as Spica inside of the constellation of Virgo. And since Spica is really low in the sky once you're looking at it, you're actually seeing it through more atmosphere because you're looking through more of the curve of the atmosphere lower near the horizon. And that means that this star will be really twinkling quite heavily. You may notice it kind of shimmering and changing colors very rapidly and that's because the turbulent atmosphere that you're looking through is bending the light from that star dramatically and rapidly and allowing different colors to kind of shine through. So you may notice that if you're looking at Spica, but of course with Venus, it's not gonna be really twinkling. Planets don't really twinkle like the stars do. That is always a good way to distinguish between a star and a planet. So you may notice the difference between those two objects. Now if we look over to the east and southeast, way over here on the other side of the sky, these objects will be rising higher through the evening and you'll find Jupiter is the brighter of the two planets you can find over here. Jupiter really shines. It's one of the first objects you may notice in that part of the sky and Jupiter is quite large and Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system and the closest gas giant to us making it very bright as seen from Earth. Opposition happened last month, so not long ago, so we're still relatively close to the planet. And then we have Saturn just a bit above and to the right of Jupiter. It's not as bright because Saturn is farther away from us, but it's still noticeable as well. And I keep saying it, but I'll say it again. If you have binoculars or a telescope, definitely take a look at those two planets because you may see some interesting features in their atmospheres or the rings around Saturn or even some of their moon because they have quite extensive moon systems. So it's really great to have planets on either side of the sky right away as the sun is setting and just after they are very bright. And as we head further into the week and you're paying attention to Venus off to the east after sunset, you may notice that the moon will join this area of the sky. So we'll go into Tuesday evening, then Wednesday, and then by Thursday, you'll find a very thin waxing crescent moon near Venus and Spica. It'll form this kind of nice little triangle. Now keep in mind, I'm exaggerating the moon just a little bit. So this is a little bit bigger than it would normally be, but it will still be nice to see those three objects. And as you move to the end of the week and into next week, you'll find the moon move a little farther away, continuing in its waxing crescent phases as we get through the weekend. Heading back to where Jupiter and Saturn lie off to the east and southeast, this is where we can find a constellation we don't get a chance to talk about very often, one that is very famous, but a little hard to see, and that is Capricornus the sea goat. And in my opinion, one of the weirder and more strange constellations, you're mixing a goat and a fish together for a very weird mythological creature, but it's kind of fun to talk about nonetheless. And it's good to look out for this constellation at the beginning of the week because we're near a new moon phase. So we don't have the light pollution from the moon making it difficult to see the relatively dim stars of Capricornus that we find here. If you want to look for it, the planets Jupiter and Saturn kind of can help you to find some of the stars of it. Jupiter is near the brightest star of Capricornus right here and another fairly bright star there. And Saturn is sort of in the middle of the constellation, but above it you'll see two relatively bright stars for the constellation as well. And altogether, the stars of Capricornus look like a very rough 
triangle as you see here it's not perfect but it kind of has a triangular shape so to help us out i'm going to draw out the constellation in stellarium you'll notice here in the program it's sort of two small triangles connected by a line let's put up the picture so you can see the sea goat capricornus is latin for horned goat which makes sense here and it's also very famous because you may know it's one of the signs of the zodiac usually referred to as Capricorn. And the reason why it's a zodiacal constellation is it lies along what's called the ecliptic line. That's the path that the sun makes through the sky. So at some time of the year, the sun seems to be moving through the constellation as we are going around the sun, of course. And so it belongs with those 12 zodiac signs, of course, which is part of astrology, different from astronomy, but it's famous definitely for that reason. In ancient mythology, there are a handful of origin stories regarding Capricornus. It's actually one of the oldest constellations in the sky. It dates back thousands of years ago to the ancient Sumerians in Mesopotamia, part of the birthplace of civilization in what is now the modern day Middle East. And to the Sumerians, this was representative of the god Ea, who oversaw the land during the day and then would fall back to the ocean at night to rest then re-emerge again during the day to oversee the land and people once again. To the ancient Greeks, there's a couple different stories. One involves Almathea, who is the foster mother of Zeus, the leader of all the gods. And in some stories, it was thought that Almathea was enshrined into the heavens as the constellation of Capricorn to remember her and to give tribute to her. Some actually think that she was actually connected to a obscure constellation in the winter sky around the star known as Capella. Another main story of Capricornus, though, involves the god named Pan. You may know Pan because he's that half man, half goat god. He was the god of shepherding, of the flock, and even of music. And in one version of the story, he is being chased by a monster known as Typhon. Typhon was a scary creature who was the father of many of the monsters from Greek mythology. And as Pan was trying to escape the attack from Typhon, he actually jumped into the Nile River. And in one version, he just turns into a sea goat and swims away. In another, one half of his body is submerged in the water, which turns to a fish, and the other half is above the water, which stays in his goat form. And this is where you get the sea goat. So there are a couple different ways of explaining it from either Greek mythology or even ancient Sumerian mythology. And if you do pay close attention to Capricornus, you may find some interesting stars. Even though they're not the brightest, some of them are interesting to look at through a telescope. If you go to where Jupiter is, Jupiter is near the brightest star in Capricornus. This star here is sometimes known as Delta Capricorni, or the ancient Arabic name of Deneb al-Gedi, or Deneb al-Gedi. Uh, al-Gedi actually means kid or goat. Usually a young goat is named a kid. So that's where the connection between those two terms come from. So this would be Deneb al-Gedi, and Deneb is Arabic for tail. So this part of the constellation is the tail of Capricorn. As you see in the picture, that confirms it. So the brightest star, Deneb al Gedi, just means tail of the goat. It's a multiple star system, like most stars are in the sky. And again, the brightest star, it does change in brightness because it has an eclipsing binary inside of the system, which means one star blocks another and does dim and brighten the star over time. There's another star kind of nearby that one right here. These two are relatively close. This one's called Nashira. Nashira means the lucky one. And then as we head above where Saturn is, up here you have some of the other brighter stars in the constellation up here. And this star here is called Beta Capricorni or Dabi. And there's actually two stars here in what's called an optical double star system. So it's actually two stars that are far away from each other, but from our point of view, they look close. So if we zoom into them and we get a little closer and through a telescope, you may see this, or even binoculars, you'll actually see two stars really close to one another. There they are. So this one's called Dabi Major, and this one's Dabi Minor. Dabi actually has Arabic origins to the name Butcher connecting it back to ancient sacrifices that were made of creatures like this long ago. And then above those two are another optical double pair. 
that you find right there. And so again, these are two stars that look close, but just from our point of view, they appear next to each other. Again, through a telescope or binoculars, you may see this. And the main one of these two is called al -Gedi, which again means the kid or the goat. And so you'll find this. this is at the head of the creature. And you have two here. This one's called Segunda Getty, and this one's Prima Getty. So two stars of this optical double pair, and each one of these stars is a multiple star system. So stars going around other stars, some are triple, some of them are even quadruple star systems. So they're quite busy. So those are probably the brightest stars you may find inside Capricornus. Again, looks like a big triangular shape you find there. Connecting the stars together, you somehow get a sea goat or the horned goat of the constellation. So hopefully you can find that if you're looking where Jupiter and Saturn lie to the east and southeast, especially at the beginning of the week. Right before we head into the weekend on Friday, September 10th, we have an interesting celestial occurrence happening when we're at opposition with an asteroid. This is called Asteroid 2 Pallas. And opposition is when we're closest to the asteroid and when it's at its brightest. The thing is, you cannot see this with your naked eyes. It's a very small little object, only about 318 miles in diameter or about 513 kilometers in diameter. And it's about magnitude 8.6, which is beyond naked eye viewing. We can see up to about six magnitude in a dark sky. And the higher you go in magnitude, actually the dimmer an object is. So at 8.6, you need binoculars or a telescope to definitely see it, but it is possible. And if you wanna find where it is, it's rising in the east right after sunset. It can be seen all night long, and it's not far from Jupiter and Saturn, which we have just talked about, where we find Capricornus right there. If I turn on another constellation, this is actually part of another water-related constellation of Pisces. It's near the head of Pisces right there. You can see Pisces the fish, if you didn't know otherwise. And if you do happen to find this asteroid in this area of the sky, it's going to look like just a little star in your field of view. If you know how to do astrophotography and time lapses, some people take a video and you can actually watch it move across the star field. And since it's named Two Pallas, the two references the fact that it is the second asteroid ever discovered. It was discovered in 1802 by someone named Heinrich Olbers, with the first asteroid being discovered known as Ceres. And Ceres today is actually called a dwarf planet. It's the biggest asteroid at the time when it was discovered, but now it has a new designation. So Pallas is still considered an asteroid, and an asteroid is a rocky solar system object, not big enough to be a planet, so they're not typically round. They look more lumpy shaped. I like to call them sort of large potato shaped rocks because they kind of look like that. This one is a little bit more round because it's a bit bigger of an asteroid. And the word asteroid actually means star-like. It looks like a star moving across the star field. And in the 19th century, when more of these asteroids were being discovered, something like this was added to the list of planets. So this used to be considered a planet long ago. And we were adding more and more of these asteroids to the planet list. So we had so, so many that a new term was invented called a minor planet. So they started putting these smaller objects into that category versus a major planet. And then eventually that term was sort of removed and it was been given the name asteroid that we still use today. Here in Space Engine, we can see where Pallas lies within our solar system. You find the sun here in the center and here are the inner planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars' orbit is here. And then you have the outer solar system way out here in this orbit. You can find Jupiter is right there. So Pallas lives in what's called the asteroid belt. If I could actually show you all the rocks of the asteroids, you'd find a ton of them in this area between the orbits of Mars. And most of them lie about on the same plane in this area. There are millions and millions of asteroids. Most of them are very small, but some of them are quite big, like Ceres also like Pallas, which is the third largest asteroid in the solar system. Number two is Vesta. So Pallas is a little bit more unusual because look at its orbit. It has sort of an inclined orbit that you find here. So you can see it's very inclined to the plane of our solar system. So most of the asteroids lie along that plane for the most part, while Pallas is a bit different. And for that reason, it makes it a tougher place to visit with a spacecraft. It takes more energy to visit a place like Pallas. So we have never actually flown by 
with a spacecraft. All the pictures we have of this asteroid are through telescopes, and even the Hubble Space Telescope has given us images of the asteroid at times when it was closer to us. And again, like I said earlier, this asteroid will be about 2.1 astronomical units away from us during opposition. And what opposition means, as we've mentioned before with other planets, is that it is that's opposite of the sun from our point of view. So if we have Earth right here, you have the sun on one side of the sky, while Pallas, the asteroid, is on the other side of the sky. And technically in its orbit, this is the closest approach to us which means it will be at its brightest. Even though you can't see it with your naked eyes, that means we have a better chance to see it through a telescope. So it's a very interesting object and one of the oldest objects in the solar system because it never formed into a planet. It's the leftover stuff that formed at the beginning of our solar system and many objects like Pallas were slamming into each other and colliding and either being flung away or being absorbed into other planets but this one remains. It's one of the lucky few, if you want to call it that, that made it out of the chaotic period of the beginning of our solar system, and it's still around today. So it really is a time capsule for the solar system, the ingredients that were there a long time ago. So sometimes you can call this a planetoid, sort of the beginnings of a planet, but never made it into one, or never coalesced or combined into a planet that we see today. So hopefully you have a chance to spot this asteroid through binoculars or a telescope coming up this weekend when it's at its closest approach to us during opposition. Again, if you want to find it, be rising in the east after sunset. It's right near the head of Pisces, the fish, as we mentioned earlier, and not too, too far away from Jupiter and Saturn. If you need a really, really precise location, you can find star charts online that are a little more detailed. A good place to go to is a place called inthesky.org which has really good information about the position of things like asteroids and where to look, and it will give you the coordinates in right ascension and declination. For those who have telescopes that are automated or have computers, you can usually type that in, or sometimes there's a database on there that will allow you to hone in on the asteroid itself. Here in Stellarium, it does give you some of that information here at the top left. If you turn on enough information in your version of Stellarium, you should be able to put up right ascension and declination up there, and it would tell you that, which then can help you either on a star chart or using telescope software to pinpoint where this is. Again, it won't be the easiest thing to find, but it is possible to look at through an optical aid. So here's to finding Asteroid 2 Pallas. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in, and as always, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and, of course, our Lohman Planetarium, where we're running shows every single day. If you want any more information about those programs, just check online on our website. So we hope to see you back here again. I'll say happy Labor Day this week, and, of course, happy stargazing. <laughs>